based on what happened to her brother, so much to the point that she's her marriage is on the rocks with her husband. But it, yeah, in this third book, she, she's really happy. She's content in her life. Things are going well, and I throw the whammy in her um, her dad, who abandoned her as a child, and who she hasn't seen in, seen in 30 years, returns unexpectedly with a lot of bad guys who are after him um, because he's broken a lot of crimes through the years. But Julia has no choice but to team up with him to solve some past and present day. I crimes. absolutely loved it. I thought it was so clever, and you know, you want you knew he was a bad guy, but you kind of you were like, well, maybe he's not so bad because he did save her life, and it just it was very well done. I guess most okay. people are neither 100% bad or 100% good. I 100% agree with you. And you know what was interesting for me as a writer? I mean, you go in, I have to write an outline before I start my, my books. And I send it to my agent, my literary agent, and my editor. And generally, it's like a kind of a guidepost for me. Okay, so here's how the story's going to go. But sometimes the story will take you in a different direction. And when I started writing, Julie's dad, his name is Duke Gooden. When I started writing, I'm like, I really don't like this guy. And then when I started... I started writing more. I was like, wow, I, I hate this, but I kind of really like this guy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, I mean, he did some, he's a negligent parent by far, but, yeah, it would be easier in life if people either wore the, the hero cape and you knew they were 100% good or you knew they were bad, but sometimes people have a little bit of both in them, don't they? Yes, absolutely. You know, I have to say that I take issue when people put too much romance in a book and... Uh -huh. In this case, when it comes to Navarro and Julia, I absolutely loved their... It was so organic between those two. I just... I really enjoyed them being together. Well, thank you. I Yeah, I like their characters. And I, I don't know if I've told anyone the story about the beginning of Ray Navarro. I remember when I first wrote the draft of the first book, I made Navarro a bit older. There was no romantic relationship. They were source. They were just source and reporter. And I remember thinking, well, what if I made him younger and there's have a romantic relationship, or they did in the past? You know, she she was the one who got away, and they have they have bicker a bit as you know Julia push and pull. Julie's trying to get information from Navarro on cases, but I've grown to really like their relationship. I do read my reviews on Goodreads or professional reviews as well, and people seem to like the Navarro character. He's a good guy. Yeah, he is a good guy. Well, that brings us to our next question. Are any of your characters based on fact? I think I mentioned before, as far as storylines, none of my plots are based on, on stories I covered on the crime beat. But again, I've tried to add some background of what it's like being a reporter working a case. My main character, Julie, and I have just there. I think we have two similarities. We're, well, maybe three. We're, we're both women. We both work, uh, we have the same professional backgrounds and we're mothers of two young boys. I think the similarities stop there. Uh, Julie is a tough cookie, but she's vulnerable too. I, I try to make her equal parts hard and soft vulnerable because of her past. I've said this before. I'm pretty sure Julia could beat me in a fight, but I, I think she would it. <laughs> So the, the, the character of Brie Navarro, um, Julia's first love and now her best source, and her beat, who we talked about, the recurring character in the series, he's loosely based on a former source and friend of mine named Ray. My friend was a, de a police detective, and we had a completely platonic relationship. Um, it, he was my best source, and uh, my friend Ray continues to help me out with background if I'm you know, in, in research before I'm starting a book. I mean, I cover the crime beat, but I'm not a cop, and I, I want to be sure that my stories are factual. I mean, it's fiction. If I write something that the police would never do an investigation, it, you know, it won't ring true and it takes people out of the story, I think. So he's been terrific. I'll give you one little anecdote about my friend Ray, who's based loosely based on Ray Navarro. The first time I ever thought about Julie's character and about possibly writing a book, it was with my friend Ray, that was based for the Navarro character, and we were having this terrible Thanksgiving dinner. We were at a diner. I had no life back then. I hadn't met my husband yet. And, and so we went, we ate at this diner. I, we were eating, eating really bad turkey, and the place served beer, thank heavens, because the food was so bad. <laughs> but, so during the meal, I was working with my friend Ray for information for a story I was working on, and I I remember he slid this manila envelope across the table to me with information I was looking for uh, for the story. It, it wasn't Watergate that I was covering, but it was a big story for me at the time. I remember driving home from the newsroom and thinking, you know, it'd be, be really cool to read a mystery featuring, featuring a female crime reporter. I, mean, I didn't start writing the book until years later, but that 
dinner with my cop friend, Ray, who was the basis for Navarro, was the start of the book. Another character on, in, in a series who's based on a real person is Julia's brother, Ben, who meant everything to her. Ben is based on the relationship with my own brother, Michael. My brother wasn't abducted like Ben. My brother, Michael, was my hero growing up. I mean, during difficult times for my family, and they were oftentimes many, my brother, he always took care of me and made sure I was okay. So my brother was absolutely my first hero and my series takes place in michigan yeah i was but, curious about that uh, but the childhood flashbacks the scenes with her brother ben are really based on Rhode beach delaware Fun that's what we that had people. a feeling yep the boardwalk uh, all of that yeah it's based on Rehoboth and really the times that i've been with my with my brother so yeah ben is, is based on my brother michael we recognize some of the names of places dollies and yeah and Fun exactly Land. Yeah, exactly. You guys what, are good. We well, well, good detectives. Well, like I said, I kind of spent a lot of time in Rehoboth myself, so right, right. So I recognized those places. You, your books are based out of Michigan, and right. we were curious on why you chose Michigan, since you seem to know a lot about a lot of places. Well, I, yeah. I, a lot and give you just a brief background my dad was british and i was born in canada we lived in england for a short time and we moved all over the place so we spent a majority of my time in Rhode beach delaware early on and, and then moved to gloucester massachusetts and then as an adult i've been all over the place yeah well, i was living in michigan at the time when i wrote the first book and i like the i like an underdog and when I was writing the first story, it was right when Detroit was really trying to get out of, of bankruptcy and the decline of the auto industry. And I really sort of likened the city of Detroit to Julia. People who oh, okay. the, the city and the character who really had both undergone very, very difficult times. And again, in, in, especially in the second book, Duplicity in the series, there's a lot of Detroit scenes. But yeah, probably because probably I like underdog so much. As a complete assumption, side here. Uh, the, the house we were living in in Michigan when I wrote the first book was like the greatest place to write a mystery. It was in the middle of nowhere. I mean, if you've been to Michigan, there's lots of lakes there. And we, we lived very close to this lake. And it's really the house we lived in is pretty much the setting for the first book. And it, our nearest neighbor was like in, a mile away. And my husband was constantly traveling. And I was alone with my kids. And they were much younger at the time. My youngest son was one. And my son Nash was, I guess, five, almost six. So I was alone in this in this great house writing this mystery book, and then when it got dark and my husband's traveling, it was just so spooky. And I remember my office was downstairs, and it, the downstairs is like it's the same downstairs in the book the last time she saw it. <laughs> we just this big playroom, and the lights go out in the, in the book. In, in Julia's youngest son is abducted. This actual playroom. I put my kids to sleep in this spooky house where I'm writing this mystery book, and my husband's traveling, and I would have to go downstairs to my office. Um, crossing this, this dark playroom and sometimes I'd leave the curtain open <laughs> and, and during the day it was lovely you know you could see the woods but at night it was just you know pitch black and if I didn't shut the curtain I'd always think Freddy Krueger would be on the other side well you know what that's what makes you a good writer because after reading Stephen King, all the fears he has, that's what makes him a good writer. If you didn't have fear, I don't think you would be able to put it on page like you uh, do. I don't believe that or just, you know, paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was a good, it was a great place to, to write my first book. One small other thing with that, I remember in that house, we didn't realize at the time, but these high school kids were going door to door at night and ringing the bell and running away. Oh, like, no! <laughs> So my husband, I remember one night, it was, yeah, it was literally 3 a.m. I'm writing the scary book, um, the last time she saw him, and the doorbell rings at 3 a.m. And you know what it's like when you wake up in the middle of the night properly with some loud noise, and my heart's thumping, and I open the front door, and these kids, I don't know what they were thinking, they left this live goldfish in a plastic bag with water, and I remember thinking, oh my god, does this mean that, you know, I'm going to sleep with the fishes? <laughs> That is funny. Oh, my goodness. Just high school kids. But maybe, maybe, you know, the the fear and all that going on helped helped to help me with the the setting for the book. (laughs) That added to it because that scene, I remember reading the first book and you could just picture her. She's stumbling around in the dark. Stepping on toys. (laughs) (laughs) And just your heart just broke for her. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Well, we have one last question, and this one's for fun. If you could form a book club with your favorite authors, who would you have in this book club and why? Oh, I love that question. That is really cool. So this could be anyone alive. Or yes, right? alive or dead. Okay. okay. So, I mean, I, and of course, humbly write Stephen King, although if he showed up, I, I'd be so nervous. I, I wouldn't be able to say a word. And we actually met him. him at a book yes. signing one time. Yes. We were very excited. Yes. And he oh was he was very great. Gracious. Oh, he always seems so humble and like such a cool guy. But I, I think I would just like melt into a puddle of butter. Like I would just, I would be a stuttering fool. I couldn't handle it. But we slept in front of a Walmart <laughs> in a very, in a not very good part of town. To, uh... <laughs> I love these ladies. I met them with no, wish you were closer. That's how, I would totally do that. That's really cool. Oh, yeah, that was a, a lot of fun. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, I, okay, so Steve, I definitely have Stephen King there. Agatha Christie would have to be there, too, because she's the queen. Yeah. She's mm-hmm. the my book club. And another mystery writer who I really, really admire is Lynn Barkley. I'm such a huge fan of his. He's one of the best domestic mystery writers around. Mm-hmm. And Dennis Lehane, one of my favorite mystery Oh, books love books. him, and, yes. Oh, he's such a great storyteller and such a great writer. And Shirley Jackson, I think one of the greatest twists at the end of the book is is in the lottery. I, she's brilliant. I, I think she's great. My, the first choice in my book club would have to be my mother. She passed away before my first book was published. And my mom was such a brilliant lady and turned me on to books and loved books so much. And But another thing she did is that she was such an appreciator of language. I remember you know, being a kid and taking walks with her. And you know, I was in school, and so she'd often quiz me on our walks about my spelling words that I'd have tests coming up um, during the week. And I vividly remember one time she told me she talked about words and language and how two words might mean the same thing but there were times when one word would be be better used than the other so there were times when sad she would tell me would be a great word to work in a sentence and other times when uh, the word sorrowful or lugubrious would be better so I really owe my mother for not only exposing me to books but to helping me think about language and words that that into a story so that's my lineup for the perfect book club well that's Sounds like a book club that I would definitely attend. Yes. <laughs> Well, Julia, this has been so much fun. Your books, I tell you, just keep going because I cannot wait for the next installment. Well, thank you. Thank you. The next book in the series, You Fit the Pattern, it comes out in March 2019. So that, that'll be fine, I hope. Yeah, oh, You Fit the, the Pattern. Series, uh, the third book in the series, Worth Killing For, will be released as an audio and paperback book in March 2019. That was released as hardcover uh, this past April. But yes, You Fit the Pattern, that's book four, is, that will be out in April 2019. Now, is this the only series that you write, or do you have plans to write anything else? Well, it's funny that you ask that. <laughs> I, just, I just finished a standalone book, and it actually takes place in the Oak Beach, Delaware. So my agent has it. It's called Whisper in the Deep. My agent is reading it right now. So Could you say uh, that title again? Sure. Uh, it's Whisper in the Deep. Whisper uh, in the Deep. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so it's just a manuscript I wrote. My agent's reading it, and I love writing the, the Julia books, and I really enjoyed that, but sometimes it's it's been fun, too, to, to work on a different book, a different location and a different character keeps my mind sharp yes yes Yes. definitely and i'll look forward to reading about rehoboth and recognizing all the places you mentioned (laughs) yeah hopefully well julia and we thank you so much for for being on our podcast we look forward to reading your future books thank you oh thank you so much for having me on i I look forward to, to listening to all of your episodes well thank you thank you well i hope you enjoyed that interview we definitely did yes jane was so gracious we really enjoyed that interview couldn't have been happier. We look forward to her future books and staying in touch with her. I hope she lets us know of any future events. So now we're going to jump into the characters the last time she saw him. Starting with Julia Gooden. In 1977, Julia's brother Ben disappears. Most of the bulk of the story takes place 30 years later, so it's 
2007, and she's a crime reporter in Detroit. She has been separated from her husband for six months. She's been diagnosed with PTSD, with borderline paranoid personality disorder, because her brother disappeared. Ben Gooden, the her brother, that he was nine when he was abducted in 1977 on Labor Day. Sarah Gooden was 14 at the time. That is 